Hey, scholars, I'm back again. Um, let's talk about Nathaniel Hawthorne, all right? Scarlet Letter. All right, this is the Custom House. This is a picture. I've been to Salem a few times. Um, really like the area up there. If you can get a chance, it's about 30 miles northeast-ish of Boston on, on your way to Cape Ann. Cape Ann has many lovely places to visit. It's not as crowded as Cape Cod. Um, and if you love lobster roll and all that good stuff, uh, the salt air, it's just, it's, it's, it's a really nice place. And you get to Gloucester, a lot of uh, places to eat there, a lot of fish. Uh, and the, uh, so let's talk about, uh, Scarlet Letter. Nathaniel Hawthorne actually worked at this custom house. He was a self-published writer. He was not making much money. He had a lovely wife, uh, Sophia Peabody, uh, who he married and he needed to make money just like yours truly needs to make money as a teacher because, of course, I'm not making any money as a writer right now. Maybe that will change in time after I'm dead, but who knows? But anyway, he needed to make money. So he was working at this custom house, and imagine being a genius like Nathaniel Hawthorne and working at a desk job shuffling papers. So a custom house would be you would work here, ships would come in, you would go on board the ship and pay taxes or tariffs, right, on what's coming in, what's going out. And at the time, or Salem used to be, before Nathaniel Hawthorne's time, very, very busy. But many, many more ships were going to other ports, like Boston. So there wasn't that much action happening in the, at the Custom House. So Nathaniel Hawthorne, of course, write about what you know, right? That's the, that's the mantra, right? Write what you know. He says, okay, I'm going to write a story. And I'm going to set it in Salem. That's where I was born. And I'm going to start it with a guy like me working at the custom house who's bored out of his mind. And he will go to the basement and find a collection of letters and memorabilia wrapped up together. And he'll find a scarlet A that had been used 200 years ago. All right, and he sees a story about this woman called Hester Prynne and Dimsdale that's written historically, right, as if this actually happened. So this has been an artifice, all right? So this is all made up in the Custom House. And this is, if you wanted to read the first 30 pages in the introduction, I told you to skip it. I'm giving you here a, uh, a summary. So what the person does, what Hawthorne does, is has his alter ego Say, I'm going to change the historical record of Hester, and I'm going to romanticize it. And here we have something called, you know, authorial intent. I mean, this guy, uh, he's, he's directing you to say what he wants you to know in the story. All right, so when he says, let this rose be a moral blossom, that the author is really intruding into the novel. Right, but that was the bit of the the idea. I mean, we have Hawthorne's voice direct, right? So he sets it in the custom house, and the story is born here, right? Based on historical record. Now there was never any Hester or never any Dimsdale. That's all out of uh, Nathaniel Hawthorne's, you know, imagination. All right, but he wants to make it seem like this was history. And when we read it, it feels like perhaps it is history. And it feels like it is 1650-ish and not 1850. All right, so this is 200 years. So even though Nathaniel Hawthorne's ancestor was part of the Salem Witch Trial, we're talking 200 years after the fact, maybe a little bit less, 175. But think about your ancestors from 175 years ago. Do you even know them? Probably not, all right? But with a name like Hawthorne in Salem, he, so Hawthorne changed it and added the W. Okay. I'll, I'll talk more about the Custom House if you guys have any questions. So that's the basis of the story. All right. This is where Hawthorne was born. A cute little house. Um, the, its present location, it was moved. It was moved here to be more centrally located to other tourist areas in Salem. Um, and if you go to Salem, you can see where Hawthorne is born, right? It's a cute little house. Um, nothing really much happens here except being born, and then he moves out. So other houses in Concord are much more important to Hawthorne's story 
than his birthplace. But, of course, it's always interesting to see where an author is born, especially if you love historical buildings like I do. All right, this is back a few years ago. Of course, I take my family on historical literary pilgrimages, uh, which they love. I'm not joking. I think they actually do love them. Uh, this is outside the House of the Seven Gables. Uh, this was another story by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Not as popular as the Scarlet Letter, and it's not really read in schools that frequently, not like Scarlet Letter. But this is an actual house that you can take a tour of. It has seven gables, and if this was an architecture class, I could talk you what a gable is. Uh, but you can see a gable right above my wife's head there. Uh, there's seven of them around the house. And this was, an, again, another romantic story uh, about a sin that goes from generation to generation to generation. So Hawthorne was, he was interested in the darker side of humanity. Even though he's a romantic, sometimes he's considered an anti-transcendentalist, which we'll talk about. I'm not sure that's actually true, but we can debate that. All right, this house is very famous. Uh, Hawthorne actually wrote the Scarlet Letter in Emerson's ancestral home called the Old Manse. All right, so we had preachers, painters, writers, philosophers have all called this home since 1770. And, and here we have uh, Sophia Peabody. Here's the very good-looking and dashing Nathaniel Hawthorne. He is a uh, hunk. Uh, we have Emerson here, very fatherly. And this is the room right here where the Scarlet Letter was composed. And at this desk right here, it was a Scarlet Letter. And in this window, Nathaniel Hawthorne, uh, wrote Sophia Peabody's name and etched it in glass. And if you go there today, you can still see the etching. I just find this stuff uh, amazing. Um, so, and here's outside the manse. This is Nancy Bound, my daughter. Uh, she is uh, outside the old manse. And this was, uh, I forget what kind of plant this was. Oh, boy, I should know this. Uh, but Thoreau actually planted this. Uh, my boy Thoreau, who wrote uh, Walden, which we'll be studying in depth soon, and, and it's still growing today. All right. Uh, so this was the birth of America in literature. It was also the birth of the American Revolution because at this house, a few yards away, or maybe 100 yards away, is the Concord Bridge that started the American Revolution. So this area is both rich in history with Concord and Lexington, and also in literature. All right, so this is the birth of transcendentalism, the birth of the literary flowering of America. It's also the, the flowering of uh, our political system with the, the first battle of Lexington, a mile up the road or so, Concord, and then, of course, you know, hopefully the history having studied U.S. History one. And if you don't, come see me, because I'm going to be a little salty. All right. Again, my family, Mrs. Bound, Madeline and Nancy, at the Old Man's. We took a nice tour of this house. Uh, this is yours truly a little lighter uh, in the summer, in summer mode, outside the Old Man's, where it all took place. Uh, Concord Bridge, of course, if you are U.S. history scholars, this is a sacred place. This is where the, uh, the Redcoats came this way. Woo! We were stationed over here up on these hills, and they tried to cross this bridge, but our Minutemen, farmers, ready in a minute, uh, repulsed them, and the Redcoats retreated. We attacked and skirmished them from the side and caused uh, mischief and mayhem uh, doing guerrilla warfare. It was pretty darn bloody, all right? Uh, but it was the, the first skirmish of the Revolutionary War. And here's the Battle of Concord from another uh, viewpoint. This river here is a very, very beautiful river. You can kayak there. We have the Minute, uh, Minute Man statue. Here's another uh, view of the House of Seven Gables. Seven Gables. This is Salem Harbor. And let's backtrack a little bit to uh, the Crucible. This is uh, John Proctor, hanged. August 19th, 1692. Again, th we have no idea where they're where they're uh, where they were buried because they were they were they were buried as witches, so they didn't have a proper Christian burial or or placard or uh, cemetery. Um, so these these are just memorials to the various uh, the 19 who died in Salem, and of course Salem today is very uh, 
a lot of tourism. Bewitched in Salem, there's witch places this, witch museum this. We have the witch mansion, haunted house, some of this stuff. When you go, if you go, I wouldn't go to these places. I would go to the historical places like this. The witch house of Judge Corwin. Now, Judge Corwin was not in the Crucible by Arthur Miller. There were many, many judges. But it's easier in literature just to have one or two judges. Right? It's just easier on the director and the audience. But this is one of the few surviving houses from the time period. And it's very, very interesting if, if you go there. And this is the burial ground. We have Judge Hawthorne buried here. Um, and this was from 1637. And we also have uh, memorials to like Rebecca Nurse and all the different uh, tragic deaths that did not need to happen. So if you have any uh, questions, please come see me. Thanks.